Thanks, Brother Richard. That's great. Praise the Lord. And all of God's people said? Amen. Amen. Let's take our Bibles and open to Nehemiah. Now, if you don't know where Nehemiah is, it might be best if you look in your contents. Uh, you get to 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, and then you find Ezra, the priest, and then comes to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8. We're getting ready for our revival days, and so today we want to look at getting back to the Word of God. And I'm sure you're here today that many of you love the Word of God, and I'm thankful for that. And, but I would presume when you leave today that there will be folks who have not really thought seriously about the Word of God and what we need to do and what it will do to us if we stay in it. Now, as we get ready to stand to read, I will not be reading verse 4 and 7 because... I don't think you would like to pronounce some of these Jewish names, but let me just let you know that I have read through them. I could do them, but uh, anyway, they're priests and religious leaders and teachers of the Word that helped Ezra get the Word out to the people. So you just follow as we read here and uh, stand together, would we, in honor of His Word. Nehemiah 8, verse 1. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. You didn't know that there was a water gate back in the Bible, did you? <laughs> and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding, upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate, from the morning until midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. Verse 5, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. When he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Verse 8. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, which is the Tershathah, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy, neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink, and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. May God bless His word. You may be seated. From the walls to the word. It was winter in Jerusalem, the year around 444 BC, 444 BC. Nehemiah is in Babylon captivity. He is serving in the king's court. He's the cupbearer. A fellow Israelite who had returned back to Jerusalem sent word to Nehemiah, the situation is bad. The walls of our dear city are broken down. 
Nehemiah gets permission to return. In the month of Nisan, this is not your car if you have a Nisan car. This is the month related to our April. It's a Hebrew month. They arrive August 1st of that year, 52 years later, September 21, the reconstructed walls are completed. Almost two miles of masonry and wall building. Now that took great faith. We may touch in some weeks ahead a little bit more about Nehemiah or I may preach a lot on Nehemiah in time to come. But anyway, they had great faith. God used him Uh, the people to come together to prepare the people to construct the walls it was through prayer and fasting the heart of perseverance mountains became molehills obstacles became opportunities trials became triumphs but something started missing after the walls were built in a short time Nehemiah realized that the broken walls were not the problem is broken lives and broken hearts separated from God and the Word of God. They turned away from God, they got lax. You don't ever get lax, do you, in your faith? Their spiritual lives had taken a nosedive. It's like the plane. You've seen the, the airplanes, they go up and they're doing the shows, and they go up and they cut the engine off. Guess what happens? Pew! Starts going down, doesn't it? They cut it back on. Then mm, go back up again. So there's a picture of the people in Jerusalem. They walked away from God, left the word of God, put the law of the Lord aside. They needed true revival just like we all do today. So first of all, if we're going to move from the walls to the word or build people spiritually, really what we're saying here, building people with the word and prepare for revival, you need to gather around the Word of God. In verses 1 through 4, you see this. Gather around the Word. Nehemiah knew the physical walls of Jerusalem were important, but there was a higher wall. It was an importance of bringing people back to the Word. He talked about the book of the law. We talk about the first five books called Pentateuch. Pen, meaning five. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. What's the last one? Deuteronomy. He calls forth a great helper. That is Ezra the priest. Ezra had come back years before. The Bible says that they gathered themselves together as one. It didn't say they compelled them to come. It didn't say Ezra and Nehemiah said, get yourself down here to the water gate. Is that what the Bible said? We're going to make you get here. We're going to come and stand and hear the word. Uh Uh-uh. Didn't beg them. They voluntarily gather together as the people of God. Now, I believe today, you should be eager and prepared and ready to come into God's presence to hear the Word. Read the Word. Now, if you go out of here today and say the Bible is not central to the preaching and teaching of the pastor, then I wouldn't tell that story. Because it's not true. You cannot leave this place without saying that this place is centered on the Word of God, especially in the pulpit. Now, God moves in the hearts of people, those who believe Him and thirst for the Word of God, hunger for the Word. He will move when His people come together in one accord or a unity of purpose or the same spirit. That's how He works. Centuries ago in Scotland, she was known as Bloody Mary. I I would have hated to meet her. She was the queen. She wanted to take land. She would kill for it and wipe out many people. You may have read about her in history. Well, at the same time, there was a fiery young preacher named John Knox. He went and denounced her sins and called her Jezebel. She said this. I fear his tongue and pen more than the armies of England. John Knox read the word of God, preached the word of God with conviction and power, and mobilized the people. They gathered together around the word of God. 
And they began what was known as the Scottish Revival of that period of history. Now, years ago, in my hometown, I went to a church who was having what I call a revival meeting, but it wasn't. Uh, they had some kind of meeting, but it wasn't a revival meeting. I don't even call it a special God-centered gospel meeting. Some people say gospel meetings are beautiful words. I wouldn't call it that. There was no reading when he stood, the guest evangelist or pastor or whatever you called him. There was no reading of the Bible. He may have quoted a verse. He told a little story. We were out and done less than 10 minutes. Some of you say, Lord, I wish Donald would do that. Well, I'm sorry. You better leave now. I walked outside with my friend. How many Bibles did I see? I had my Bible under my arm, or my hand. He had his Bible. Because we met together, he had his Bible. I mean, what, were you, what are you doing going to the house of God without your Bible? Now, some folks have had, we got the phones now. You got iPads. Hey, Whatever you got, if you got the Word of God, fine. But I like the Word of God, written Word, really. No other person. I, I didn't see one person that had a Bible. I tell you what, it was not a revival meeting. And you know, that little, that little church was packed. I would just say, how many people could sit on this one side? Would you say 75? Something like that. There was about 75. It was, it was pretty good packed. You had, well, really you had two rows, but... Half of that, I guess, each part. I want to know, why do you gather at the house of God? Is it important to read the Bible? Is it important to expound it, preach and teach it? Is it important for the soul sitting there to understand something about the Word of God for their life? Should it be taken out of this place and shared with others? Do we need the Word of God? Do we need the gospel? Jesus Christ, the Son, Savior, only Savior, risen Lord, coming again King. It should be spread out, given out, planted in the hearts of people. The Jews awakened when they came to hear the word of God. Look with me in verse 3, would you? This is Ezra now, the priest. He read. How long did he read? If your Bible has anything close to what this says, from morning until midday, that's usually 6 o'clock to 12. If I read for 15 minutes, some of you might get up and leave. Do you know that? Now, I don't know if the people there got nervous or what, but I'll tell you what, they got shook up. Because the Spirit of God was so powerful, it moved in their lives. They gathered to build the spiritual lives around the Holy Word of God because they hadn't heard about it in a long time. So, they gathered around. Secondly, if we're going to move from building walls to building spiritual lives with the Word of God, you know what? It's not going to take reverence for the Word. Reverence. In verses 5 and 6, what happened when Ezra opened the book? The book of the law. Called the Holy Word of God. He stood up on the pulpit. Verse 4. Verse 5, he opened the book. And when he opened it, what happened? All stood. All stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Put this in your memory bank. Deep reverence for the Word of God will lead you to praise and worship the living God of His Word. Did you get that? Deep reverence for the Word, written Word, will cause you to awaken to the living Word of God. It was a practice in the Christian churches of Scotland that the service would begin by the entrance of a man. I've done this once or twice here before. Had someone to do it. Come through the back doors holding the big Bible. 
The big Bible right here. Church Bible, you call it. And when he started walking, he, everybody stood up. And they stood until he came. He opened the Bible. The pastor or the priest or teacher came and read it. Then they sat down. They humbled themselves. They were serious about the word. How do you acknowledge the Bible? There's, that's a, there's a great problem in America today, even in the churches. I said, even in churches. They think it's some kind of religious book or some kind of fables and myths and just things put together. You haven't read this word of God, Genesis to Revelation, if that's what you believe. It's God's holy book. God's perfect book, inerrant word of God, alive, transforming, truth. Called writers over 1,600 years to write the story of his story. His name was Martin Luther, the great German reformer, late 1400s, early 1500s. He came known as the leader of the Protestant Reformation. Those who do not know that need to look back this story says he's studying for the priesthood as a, as a Roman Catholic for seven years he found an old Bible locked and chained to a pulpit in a storeroom where he was studying he broke the lock and for the first time he was able to open it and read the word of God himself very brilliant man, reading the German, I'm sure Latin and all and the other kinds of uh, uh, the, the language. But it changed his life. He read Romans. Romans was one of the great books that changed his life for history and also changed our way of worship even up to this day. Reverence for the word will lead to true worship. The word should be reverenced by all. When we open the word and expound it and exalt the Savior, it should be personal and powerful and pure and stirring and praiseworthy and spirit-led. Great Americans down through the years have reverenced the word of God. Just think of this person. There is no solid basis for civilization but in the word of God. Who said that? The great writer of the dictionary, Daniel Webster. We need to do some soul searching. Where is your personal Bible? Do you ever mark your Bible? Now if you come look at this Bible today, this is what I call my reading Bible. Just the reading. I don't really mark this Bible. Is it on your bed stand or bookshelf or table collecting dust? Or is it the central book of your life? Do you open it daily? I didn't say weekly, monthly. I said daily. Do you have a personal quiet time? You can call it whatever you want. And I didn't say just reading one verse here and there, hop, skipping and jumping. That is not going to challenge your life daily in a walk with God or have true revival in your life or family. Do you ever share what the Bible means to you with others? Those who are great texters, email people today on your phones constantly. When have you sent a verse to somebody lately? There's not many days a week that goes by that I don't send something out on texting or email about the Word of God. You can do that. We as the body of Christ at church, if we do not reverence God's word, then what's going to happen outside of the church? Do you think people outside of Christ are going to share the word of God? No. No. Only those who love the Lord will love the word. You want to hear it and heed it, love it, live it, pray over it, practice it, speak it, share it. That's when revival comes. Or at least a foundational beginning. 
Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void. That means empty without accomplishing what it's supposed to. It goes forth. Thirdly, we're going to build our spiritual lives. The word of God needs to be explained. Explained, number three, verses seven and eight. There was a personal counseling time at the Jerusalem revival meeting. You didn't know that, did you? Way back in history, they had counseling times. The Levites and the other priests, these ones in these words here are the names that we did not read. They got down to business. They had the people stand to hear the reading, but then they began to instruct them, teach them to understand and make it clear. Look at this word, the old English, this King James. They read in the book the law of God distinctly. Have you ever heard somebody get up and start reading the Bible or speaking or preaching and you have no idea the words they're saying? I, I've heard people stand up and it's a lot of jumbo gumbo. Do you understand what I'm saying? It has no connection whatsoever. They said, we're going to teach you distinctly. We're going to help you to understand what it says. The Bible Society of South Africa, when they were trying to do the Bible translation, they came to one African dialect or language. It was called Southern Sotho, S-O-T-H-O. So the typesetter was typed, and it did J-W-A-L-A, Jwala, which means beer, instead of typing J-W-A-L-O, which means so. So the result of Genesis 1-9, and God said, let the water under the sky be gathered in one place, and it was beer. Because of a typesetting of a letter. That's, that's very serious, isn't it? I mean, that's... You want to get it right. You don't want to make it mixed up to people. Sometimes what happens in translation of especially other kinds of languages we don't know anything about or understand. You've got to make it clear. So it is in the English language. You've got to make it clear. The Bible is meant to be read and heard and revered. It means to be understood and digested. That means take it in. Just like you take in food, physical food. It needs to be obeyed and applied. Take what you read in here and filter it through the Holy Spirit's wisdom and apply it in your daily life. Story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, Acts 8. You've read that story before. He ran along beside the chariot. He asked him what he was reading. He was reading in the book of Isaiah about the suffering servant, about Jesus. Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? He said, I don't unless somebody teaches me. So he took him aside. He taught him about Jesus. He came to Christ. I guess he went on back down to Ethiopia and began to share the first Christian message, the gospel, for the first time. To the people. What needs to happen before one can explain and teach the word? Now I want you to turn your ears up here. Your spiritual ears. Understand? Is everybody with me? What needs to happen before you can explain? And it does not have to be me to explain the word of God. You must know the God of the word. That He is revealed Himself as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He's a triune God, everlasting God, the great I Am. He came in the person of Jesus Christ, died on the cross, buried, third day rose again, ascended on heaven, and He's coming again. Do you know Him as Savior Lord? If you don't know Him, you don't know anything about the Word of God. If you don't have salvation through Jesus and a relationship to God through the Son, then you don't know anything about the Scripture. You've got to know Him. Preacher stood in a, another pastor's office one day and said, Brother Pastor, I've never preached a sermon about Jesus. He said, I don't know anything about him. I was a preacher to another preacher said that. Short while he quit ministry. That was good. 
That was good. All Scripture is inspired of God, profitable for doctrine and reproof, 2 Tim 3.16 and following. It's not a private interpretation, but men were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's divine guidance of God's Spirit, 1 Peter 1.20 and following. So you know God. Listen to God and His Word. You're being taught. You've heard the Word preached from holy men of God. You live in the Word. You abide in His Word. John, that's John 15 if you want a good reading. Stay in it. Continue in it. Pray over it. Jesus said in John 8, 31, If you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Then you study. You study it out as you go along and listen and live in it. Then you're able to teach it. But if you don't have that background, you can't explain the Word of God. Ezra didn't just didn't call people from anywhere that day. They were priests. They were the one who had been studying the law with him. So they could go out and explain to the people. Fourthly, if we're going to build our spiritual lives and get ready for revival. There must be weeping and celebrating over the Word. Weeping. And celebrating. Verses 9 through 12. We find here verse 9 an interesting phrase. Nehemiah and Ezra. They taught the Levites that taught the people. This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Now, what does the law do? It shows us when we're wrong. Isn't that true? The commands of God show us when we have done wrong. And all have sinned. That's why the Bible says. That's why Paul would say in Romans 3. We're all under sin. All separated from God. We all disobeyed God. We disobeyed His law. You break one, one sin, you've broken them all. Break one command, you've broken all. Is that what the Bible teaches? Absolutely. So we all fail. We all sin. But these folks, they, they came alive, friends. They saw the danger, misery, and curse that sin would bring in a life. The Jews saw, saw they had offended the Lord and saw themselves guilty before a holy God. And until we see that we are guilty and sinners before God, then there's not going to be any repentance. There's evidence of real revival starts breaking out when people begin to weep or sorrow over their sin. They have sincere grief. They're crying out to God. They're sorry for what they've done. Their hearts begin to turn. They change their mind and their direction of life. Some time ago, I went to see a young man. I would say he was about 20 at that time at the county jail. His name was on the membership roll, not here. So don't try to think about it. I went to find somebody here. His name was on the membership roll. I did it because of his parents, really. He didn't care about me, and really, I don't know if I care much about him. It's just the way it was. But because of his parents, I must go in my heart. They didn't tell me I had to go. I must go. I want to see what he's thinking. I got there. No brokenness. No, he never said a word. He never said one phrase that I'm sorry for what I did. Not once. No brokenness, no weeping. Oh, he said, preacher, when I get out of here, you know what I'm going to do. I said, okay, we'll see. He came one Easter. Once. That's it. That's it. I never saw him again. I don't know if I ever saw him again. You see, no weeping, no joy. No sorrow for sin. How can you have any change of sin in your life? Any repentance? It's different with Nehemiah and Ezra and the boys and leaders there. These people mourned. They, they were broken hearted. They, they really were in an attitude of repentance. They mourned so much that Nehemiah said, wait a minute. It's time to quit. 
I think you've taken, to God, taken it to God long enough now. It's time to get some joy in your heart. Rejoice. God's forgiven you. Wake up. Verse 10 and 12, I'll paraphrase this. It said, boys and ladies and families, it's time to eat some good lamb chops. Get some good ribeyes from those fine calves. Let's drink some of our sweet drinks and juices, whatever they had. You didn't know what he's saying? Just read it. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Verse 10, after you have repented and been sorrow for your sin, then God's word says, wake up. Be joyous. See, the joy of the Lord takes hold for those who belong to him and understand what he's done for us and how he's changed us. Especially today in the Christian realm, changed by the grace of God through his son Jesus. The glorious gospel, the cross, the resurrection, his ascension, now coming again. If you're forgiven and cleansed, wake up. You're revived again. Have joy in your soul. People in Nehemiah's day had true joy because the Lord had become what? Central. Central. The word became central and God of the word became central to their life. Change them. See, if it, do you feel, you know when I lie down, this, this, is, uh, this is just personally, it's a very beautiful picture. When I lie down at night, I don't have to be thinking about, oh God, what have I done today that's going to destroy my life with you? You know, I don't go to bed thinking about that. I've already taken care of it. I've given it to the Lord. Already. If I've done something wrong in my heart and mind, the Holy Spirit says, you said a wrong word. So I ask him, Lord, in my quietness of my heart, Lord, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that in my heart. He knows your heart. He knows your attitude. Are you walking in the presence of the Lord? Is he central to your life? No, I'm not worthy of anything. He's the one worthy and he takes care of me. Did he take care of you? If you love him, trust him. He blesses you in different ways. What's going to happen when people understand the word? I'm speaking now to the church. Should be holy joy, deep satisfaction with the Lord. Celebrate the goodness of God. Honor him. King David knew about that after he confessed his sins. Was cleansed and forgiven. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, Psalm 32, 1. He had a joy in his soul. And it's the same for us today. In this day of tranquilizers, it's likely to make an aspirin pill of religion. The Word of God is not a lullaby to put us to sleep. It's a reveille to wake us up. Send us forth. That's what Vance Habner said about the reveille to wake us up. The word of God in Hebrews 4.12 is quick and powerful. What does that mean? Quick. It's alive. It's living. Filled with might and strength of the Holy Spirit. Sharper than any two-edged sword. It just cuts. It, do you know what a two-edged sword is? It cuts where? Both, both sides. And he will cut out of you. He does the perfect surgery with his word. Do you know that? He doesn't go just whacking your head and cutting in your head and arms. If you picture somebody like that with a sword, he goes to the place that's needed. Something that needs to be removed, he removes it. Cleanses you. Forgives you. Brings forth conviction in your life through his spirit. The Jews saw themselves as they really were right before the mirror. When he started reading that law, the word, the word of God, it just revolutionized their life, transformed them. Backsliders started going back to God. Those away from the truth of God, they, became come, they kept coming back to the Word. Caused great repentance, turning from their sins. Nehemiah and Ezra used of God to help build their lives around the Word. Several weeks ago, I entered a business. I was a little, little gal. She's not a day over 21 because I asked her. She said, I graduated three years ago. So I presume, she's talking about high school, so I presume that puts her about, what, 21 years old, correct? So, 
we talked a minute and I asked about her family. She uh, had a little child and a man left her or whatever it was. They got married young or whatever. Anyway, so I asked her about the church. I said, you attending any church? By? She said, yes, I go with my grandparents. I said, I know about that church. I said, I knew the pastor years ago. She said, oh, yeah, I, he was there for years. And I asked her who was there now. I don't know. I, saw, I thought I was doing, those who were here in the past month or so, I've been doing some things on resurrection. Remember that? Did some messages. We just didn't do Easter resurrection. We continued on with the resurrection uh, of the Lord. I said, is, is he preaching any kind of specific messages that you do about Easter and resurrection and all? And here's what she said. All he talks about is politics. All he talks about is politics. I said, I'm sorry. And I said, you know, as a pastor, I can talk with people on the side about politics, but I will not, I will not enter this pulpit to preach on politics. That is the kingdom of the world. God says, you've got a new plan, brother, a new purpose, a powerful purpose to preach my word to a people hungry and thirsty and dying. For the word of God. Now, it doesn't mean we don't talk about the country sometimes or government things in an illustration. I'm not saying that. That's fine. I gave her some encouragement. 21, longing for the truth of the word of God. I'd like to see about 25, 21-year-olds here longing for the word of God. It's a challenge, encouragement. People are, are coming today, and it don't matter if they're 21 or 81. People need the encouragement and help and strength and the joy of the Lord. It's our strength. Well, what are you doing in your spiritual journey with the Word? If you want revival to take place, it first, it's got to be in your life. That's why I'm bringing this message back again about the Word. You're going to have to start somewhere. And there's no greater place than your own personal dealing with the Word of God. You're going to have to settle that. I can't do it for you. I can just proclaim on Sundays or Wednesdays when we open the Bible. But that's only a few minutes. A few minutes. call goes out maybe unsaved today it means you're lost you're undone you're separated from God if you do not know Jesus as personal Savior Lord then you're lost and I heard something this week it ought to really catch your attention I want you to listen carefully someone asked the pastor pastor is on the radio he's a powerful man of God loves the Word of God he said when Jesus talked about darkness what is he talking about? He said, hell is outer darkness. Outer. You'll never, ever see the light again. And I said, wow. How many walk, walk around in your house in the black pitch of night if everything was off, there's no electricity? No light bulb, no little battery of a flashlight or anything. Just, just think of complete darkness. If you're outside of Jesus, that's what it's going to be like. Jesus said, we've been in national teeth in outer, outer darkness. Come to Christ. Trust Christ. Repent and come to Christ. On church, if you need the Lord be a part of His church body, you need to come. Be a part of His church family. Christian church member, I challenge you. If you want to help revival in May, if you want to help be a part of true revival, let's see how you deal with the Word of God. Okay? Steve, come and lead us, please.